Entrepreneur MBA podcast purpose is to help existing business owners grow their companies past the $10 million in revenue per year benchmark. Here is your host, Stephen Halastic. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halastic, and I am co-founder and fi- uh, co-founder of Financing Solutions. Over the last 25 years, I've built six companies in the $5 million to $25 million range. And I can't tell you how important it is for businesses to have a line of credit so they can make an investment in their business or even for unexpected emergencies. Our line of credit program is easy to get in place, inexpensive when used, and costs nothing to set up, making it a great cash backup plan that every entrepreneur should have. If you'd like to learn more about our line of credit program, please visit us at fscreditline.com. Again, that's FS as in Financing Solutions, creditline.com, or give us a call at 862-207-4118. If you apply today, we will even give you a $250 credit on file that you can use when you are using your line. Just a reminder that the best time to set up a line of credit is when you don't need it, so that when you do need it, it is ready to go. Today, I'm very excited to be speaking with Robert Kennedy from Kinetic Communications. Robert Kennedy III, or also known as RK3, uh, didn't know he liked to speak, he, uh, yet he always found himself in a position to do so. At church, at school, uh, being a teacher, uh, with music groups, and in business, he always uh, loved uh, to, to talk, and he also always loved technology. He once took part apart a radio just to see if he could put it back together. He got it back together, but it was never the same. Uh, but luckily, he was only 11 years old at the time. The technology, uh, the speaking, and even the radio came together eventually as, as his background includes times as a news anchor, a classroom teacher, and a technology trainer. Now he works with business leaders who who need to connect with their teams, especially on video. He shows them how to connect using storytelling as a tool. When he's not doing storytelling work, he's probably dabbling with something in his home studio or hitting a ball of some sort. Robert, welcome to today's Entrepreneur MBA podcast. So glad to be here, Stephen. Thanks for having me. So today's topic is how storytelling helps business owners communicate. And from your experience, have you seen that typically very, very good business owners are great storytellers? The majority are not. You Mm -hmm. do have a few that are automatically or just maybe they've grown up that way or they just are naturally great communicators. You have some people who do have an inkling for that, who who, who have a leaning towards just being able to connect with people. They're charismatic. They are able to reach people really easily. But the majority of business owners, a lot of times we feel like the way to convince people or the way to share information is through a lot of statistics and data. And so we chuck that stuff at people. Our presentations are chock full of data and charts and and bar graphs and scatter plots and a lot of bullet points. And so there's a lot of information overwhelm in businesses. And, you know, the majority of business owners that I come across really could use some help with communicating and connecting more effectively. Well, why do you find that storytelling is so um, uh, important and, and, uh, and why is it a great way to communicate? Well, it's the, it's the way that we've communicated for years, you know, from uh, you know, if we, go back to the beginning of time. I mean, before we knew how to write, before hieroglyphics was a thing, right? before we had papyrus, before we had anything, how did we share information? We shared information orally, and we shared it typically through experiences, reminding people about, okay, your grandfather did this, your great-grandfather did this. This is, this is wh- why this heirloom or this specific object was passed down to us because of this. And we share things through moments and through stories. And so that's only begun to change the more that we have come into the technological space because we are stuck on systems and processes 
and data. And so we feel that's how we have to translate the information when in actuality, people really lean in more when you tell them a story rather than just sharing statistics and percentages. So what what do you think makes um, a story, a storyteller? I mean, what, mm-hmm. is the, what is the format of a, of a story? Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I, I teach four main areas when I speak about storytelling to organizations. I teach that stories mainly have four areas. The first area is what I refer to as context. And really, you are setting, you're, you're giving the setting, you're giving the the level set. You're telling what the current experience and situation is. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to watch this show called Golden Girls. You remember that show, man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So there were these four ladies in the house and one of them, the oldest one, she was kind of the youngest actress, by the way, um, but she was the oldest one in the show. Uh, Sophia, Estelle Getty. She, she would always tell these stories and she started them out the same way every time. Picture it, Sicily, 1933. <laughs> <laughs> right? So... What she was doing was putting you in that space. She was telling you, hey, this is where it happened. This is when it happened. And then she was doing this brain hack, right? She was literally taking control of your mind for a moment because she was telling you, picture it. So when somebody says, picture it, what do you begin to do? You begin to start to think about that. You begin to create an image in your mind. A video starts to play in your mind. And so she is really pulling everybody into that same space where she is. So that's the first piece of storytelling context. And then the second piece of storytelling is characters. You got to have characters, right? You got to have things or people or beings that your audience can relate to, right? If you're just telling them information about numbers, they don't always relate to that because you know, they don't always put themselves or they don't know how it's experienced by human beings. Right. And so we've got context, we've got characters. So that's two C's. The third C is conflict. What's broken? What's happening? What is an opportunity that is existing? I mean, if you think about a movie, so there's this movie where a man and a woman, they thought that it would be good to send their child on a trip. And so they packed their child in a spaceship and sent that child to another planet landed on that planet and he got found in this field by a man and a woman. They found the child and they clothed him and they, they, they sent him to high school and then they sent him to college. Then after that, he went to work at a newspaper. He met this other reporter. Her name was Lois. They fell in love. They got married and lived happily ever after. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want my money back. I mean, <laughs> right? What, what, what's the deal? What, what am I listening for in, in that story? So we need the villain. We need the broken stuff. We need to know what the challenge, what the obstacle, what the problem is, because that's just how life is. We have obstacles and challenges and problems. And if you're going to put information in front of me and show me that you don't understand my problem or my challenge, then I'm not as likely to listen. Yeah, that was so, that was very articulate the way you explained that. That was a good job. Yeah. I, like I appreciate that. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's so, the fourth C? The fourth C is conclusion. So context, characters, conflict, and then conclusion. And conclusion is, is the solution for the problem. That's, that's the thing. If you're a business owner, that's your product, your process, your program, your project, your solution, right? That's, that's the detail of things. How many times have you been to a networking event and Somebody comes up to you and the, the question that people most most people ask is, hey, what do you do? Somebody says, hey, this is what I do. I, I, I sell computers. I, I'm an IT service, blah, 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 blah. And they say all this stuff. They jam their card into your hand and then they leave. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? I, yeah. I, I mean, you have no idea who I am, what yeah. I need. You know, I was sitting in my living room. I, I lived in Massachusetts for a while. I told you that before the show. And uh, my doorbell rang. And I go to the door. There's this dude outside in the driveway, and he's got this display board. And on the display board were these little squares, these little swatches. And I go outside, and he says, hey, my name's Tim, and I'm I'm selling carpet in the neighborhood. I've got all these different types of carpet. You should come out and feel it. I've got 
uh, Berber. I've got the Austin Power shag. I've got these, and he named like five different types, and I touched them. And he said, "Yeah, which 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 one of these interests you?" And then I opened my door and showed him my house, which had hardwood. Mm. <laughs> right. So I'm like, dude, I you you came at me with the conclusion. You came at me with the product, with the solution. But you didn't even know if that solution would solve my problems. You, you had no idea what my needs were or what I was even interested in. And too often we do that as, as business owners. A lot of times we do it as people. We, we come talking at people and we don't know what they need, what their challenges are, what they believe in, what they stand for, and what they're struggling with. So we, we, if we utilize the storytelling format and include that conflict area and we got to think about it from that perspective that really helps us to connect with people even more closely yeah it um i'm a good storyteller right yes but and but i never uh brought up i never took and broke it down Mm -hmm. as to why i was a good story but probably you know it's like playing a sport right or playing an instrument well, uh, maybe a sport is a better because I think, you know, my philosophy a lot of times about sport is, uh, you know, do it. And then you can start breaking it down into the little parts, mm-hmm. because unless you start doing something, then you you really can't analyze it later. It's it's much I think it's much harder to say, OK, there's four parts, there's four C's. Um, you know, I don't know how to story tell. So now I'm going to start right in the beginning. And, yeah. you know, it, 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 you know, people do say in sports, it's better to do it that way to, because then you don't pick up bad habits. Right. Right. But I've never known any, uh, any sport I've ever played to be where, okay, you know, let me analyze the entire baseball swing before I go and I decide how I'm going to hit the ball. Right. Well, we don't necessarily do it that way um, intentionally every single time, but we do do the analytics. I'll use another example. When my daughter, my daughter just went to college and about a year and a half ago, she took her driver's test. Now, When she first started to drive, as she had her dad as her teacher, she would get in the car and we would she would go through a sequence of things. Okay, let me look in this rear view mirror. Let me look in that rear view mirror, side mirrors. Let me fix this. Let me make sure there's nothing around me. Let me back out and then let me think about how how much pressure I have to apply to the accelerator to get the car going. After she gets her permit. And we go through this and she gets her license. Man, she's like a bat out of, you know, where going down the, the out of the cul-de-sac here. Right. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, why is she going? So but she's become more confident in this because she has she's now accelerated the sequence in her mind of the steps that she needs to take. Right. And it's the same thing. If I if I if I play baseball when I'm a kid. And somebody puts the bat in my hand or a wiffle ball bat in my hand and I swing. I'm probably just hacking at it like I'm chopping a tree with an axe. Yeah. Right. But somebody says to me, OK, hey, Stephen. Hey, Robert, try swinging this way. Put put your elbow up, do this and try to swing this way. And so the first couple of times that you do it, you're like, OK, elbow up. And you're mentally thinking through that process. After you play a few games, you're not thinking elbow up, swing, et cetera, et cetera, anymore. You're just reacting, right? And storytelling is the same way, right? We 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 don't remember somebody in our lives saying, okay, dude, you got to include the context. You got to include the character. You got to include the conflict. But you were probably around great communicators. You were probably around great storytellers in your life. And you listened to and heard how they connected, right? You heard what they did. And not only did you hear what they did, you saw how people around them responded when they, when they, when they spoke. And so now subconsciously you pick that up 
and you begin to apply those same steps to how you communicate. This, the inverse or the, the, the converse is true for others as well. If you're around people as, as, as children that may not be strong communicators. For example, if, you've, if you're a child and you're around family that like they just yell all the time, chances are the way that you communicate <laughs> when you get a little bit older is going to be quite loud, right? And so yeah, it, the, the steps are there. They're in there. Uh, and if we become more intentional about breaking them down, we can become better at them and we can enhance them. But they're there nonetheless, because uh, as I said, right at the beginning of this, as human beings, storytelling is, 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 is what we do. That's like the most natural form of communication and the most connected form of communication for us. So right now you are you're a business coach. Is that is that correct? I'm no, we run a training company. We we share, we teach business leaders how to communicate and connect effectively. Okay. And and so the the so you put people in a group. Are they, mm-hmm. they you do that via Zoom now or, or do you do that the uh, uh 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 to get being together? Well, more so in the virtual space now than 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 before. Yeah, up up to up to 2020, I would say the majority of what we did was was in-person training. Yeah. H- how long is a training typically? It, it can be an entire day. It can be two days. It really depends on what people want. For the virtual trainings, we typically don't do a full day at once. It may be two and a half hours, three hours over the course of a couple of days. Um, so we'll do two and a half today, two and a half tomorrow, something of that nature. So it's it, it varies depending on the, the medium that is being delivered in. Now, the people who come to your courses, mm-hmm. uh, what is typically the reason why that you see most often? Well, a lot of times they feel like they're delivering information, but people either are not moving, there's not a lot of action taking place, or they feel like there's some confusion. They A lot of times when we communicate and we're not communicating effectively, we feel it. We don't exactly know what's wrong, but we see the responses on people's faces or we see that, man, I said this, but nobody did it. Nobody moved to action on it. Another word that happens or another term that we deal with is the term influence, right? Um, I'm in a meeting and I speak and everybody nods, but somebody else speaks and they say similar or the same thing that I say. And everybody's face just lights up. What what's the difference there? Why, why did nobody listen to me? Why did my words fall flat while the other person's words light everybody up? What 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 was it? What was the difference? And quite often that difference is not just storytelling, but how I deliver something. There's there's a charismatic, there's an energetic, there's an executive presence difference in how I deliver certain pieces of information. But it starts out with everybody, the, the deliverer making everybody feel like um, they can own the, the idea. They can be a part of it, you know, instead of me just giving you a command or a directive. Now, the, if you had to say uh, a, a, not a um, correlation is not the right word. Um, if you had to say the people who typically come to your training, um, like, are they more introverts than extroverts that come uh you know my guess would be just 60 percent are introverts and 40 percent are extroverts that would be my guess because you have the opposite problem with extroverts where they're talking too much Mm -hmm. and uh and people aren't listening uh and then you have the introverts who who maybe don't know how to communicate uh Mm -hmm. Uh, because they're a, a, a little scared, um, right? Uh, is there is there a correlation? And it doesn't have to be introvert extrovert. Is there a a commonality that you see in the people who typically uh, are trying to get training to improve their communication skills? Well, as far as personality styles or personality traits, I don't know that there is. I've quantified the 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 the, the groups of people. I mean. I do sense that we don't 
always have a full understanding of who we are and what we do as it relates to communication and even how we operate personally. So, for example, if we're talking about introverts, so sometimes that we'll get people that say, um, I don't like to do this because I'm an introvert or I get nervous about this because I'm an introvert or because I'm shy. And the truth is that introversion is not necessarily a shyness or that I don't like people or I don't like to talk. It's just about how I how how energy flows. So, for example, Robert Kennedy, the third, has always been identified by Myers-Briggs as an introvert. When I share that, most people don't believe me for some reason or not. Right. And the reason that they don't believe me is they say, well, dude. You're in front of people all the time. You're a teacher, you're a speaker, you're a trainer, you're always in front of people. How on earth could you be an introvert? And I'm like, yeah, when I'm done with all of this peopling, when I'm done with all this speaking, I'm drained. My energy is drained, right? It's like people, peopling drains energy from, from me. My wife is the opposite of me. She's an extrovert. And she gets lit up. She, when people are around, she gets energized and she's like, Oh my gosh, I need more people. When we go to the amusement park, she literally wants to stay until the place is shut down. It, if, if it closes 11, she's like, listen, we're not leaving until 10 59 59. <laughs> right. And Robert is like, okay, after a couple of hours of doing all of that, I'm okay. Can, can we start thinking about, you know, what we're going to pack up and when we're going to leave? Because that's 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 how the energy works for me right so once people understand a little bit more about who they are and then what result they want okay so it's okay i if 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 i want this result if i want to influence people if i want people to move to action in a certain way then how do i show up for that moment what tools do i need in order to be the best or to achieve the best result in that situation. And communication and storytelling is just one of those tools that we share with people. And we're like, listen, it doesn't depend on your personality. It depends on you deciding the result that you want and then choosing which tools you need to use to achieve that result. Yeah. I, I, I guess the, the, the common denominator could be um, if you're in a role no, well, if you're in a role where communication is really important mm-hmm. to your job or your success, um, then that looking at how you communicate, rather you're good or just okay at it, mm-hmm. if it's a pretty smart decision to work on that part of it. Because having you say what you said um, – you know, if if someone's in a, communi- a a very important communication role, they're a leader of a company, they're a leader uh, in, in their organization, their manager, they're they're constantly uh, giving speeches, uh, yeah. they're 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 giving feedback, all those other things, um, and they're doing a lot of communication. Then understanding how you do communicate, how you communicate now, um it could really, really help your career. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. Absolutely. Warren Buffett, uh, for those people that don't know the name, she's probably slipped down the list now, but uh, top five richest man in the world. Right. Right. Warren Buffett states and says, you can look it up online. The best decision that he made for his career was deciding to take a Dale Carnegie public speaking course. Yeah. When he was younger, he actually was given the opportunity to take it. And they said, you can take it and it costs a hundred dollars. He's like, nah, I don't want to pay a hundred dollars. And he didn't take it the first time. Yeah. Then the next time he started it, but he just, he gave up on it. He didn't finish it. And then finally he was in his, in his career and he saw how certain people were getting opportunities, how certain people were connecting and how they were, they were moving up or they were influencing. And he said, wait, wait a minute. I need to do this. And so he just, you know, he wrote the check and he took the course and he was speaking to some college students several years ago and said, listen, 
if you do this, this one thing will more than triple your value to any organization that you are a part of. It's, it's, it's going to change your, the amount of money that you can generate and the income that you can generate yeah. simply because you invest in the art of communicating even more effectively. And communicating is not just, okay, can I talk without saying um or ah? It's not just, can I talk without using filler words or is my vocabulary large enough? It's about how do I relate to people? How do I make them feel like I understand who they are and what's important to them? And if they feel that way, then influence is the outgrowth of that. Give me an example of a, a really amazing transformation that you've seen from somebody. A real life example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somebody that you could think of, picture them in your head right now, someone that you kind of saw, they came in, you could describe them to us. Yeah. And then and then tell us the 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 outcome of the end result. Um Yeah. I mean, there are, there are so many different stories. I think one that sticks out for me was I was doing, I have this group online called the Storytellers Growth Lab. And there was a lady that came to the group and, and was involved in a couple of our sessions. And she is a therapist and she went to, she went to school, she got her doctorate, et cetera, et cetera. And we were going through how to be confident on camera, how to do to communicate live for your business. And she was in the room. She was in, and this was virtual. She was in this, in the zoom sessions. So she came to several of them and she, she didn't want to talk. She didn't, she didn't want to talk. And when we said why, or why, and we were processing it, she said, well, I'm, I'm scared of, you know, the criticism. I'm scared. I'm going to mess up. I'm scared that I'm going to come across as a babbling idiot. And, and, People are going to laugh at me and not take me seriously. And we had some sessions where what we did was we we said, okay, we're not asking you to come up in front of us and go live, but we're asking people to create these videos so that you can watch it so that we can talk through it and you can get some feedback on it. And she didn't want to do that. But finally she was able to, she did one and she, she went through it. And so we did several of these sessions and I noticed that she kept coming. She kept showing up first few. She didn't want to talk that much, but she kept coming. She kept, she kept showing up. And by the time we reached about the fourth challenge, she was there and she started to make a few videos. And then I remember about five or six months after one of the challenge, I I was online doing something and I saw her online and I was like, whoa, you know, who's this person? Because her entire aura had changed. Her entire confidence had changed. And, and what she was online doing was she was promoting a book that she had just written. Uh, (laughs) And so I'm like, okay, there's this person that didn't really want to share, but now they've written the book. They're online talking about this book with confidence. They're, they're going forward. And so, you know, she had sales from the book. She, she began to invite people into her own coaching course that she developed. And these things came as a result of her taking on the challenge for herself that, listen, I'm going to learn how to communicate more effectively. I'm going to learn some frameworks, including the storytelling framework that Robert was sharing that will help me to be more confident online and live or on video. And those are some of the basic things. I mean, there, there, there are stories that I can share about people who have gotten jobs because of some of the training that, that we've got, we've gone through sales training. A a lady came to me one time and she said, my God, I've got this job that interview that's coming up and it's three stages. And I'm not sure if I'm ready for it because they want me to do, to do the interview, but then they want me to do a mock sales presentation as a part of the interview. And I'm totally not ready. I don't know. I've never done this before. I don't know how to do it. I'm freaked out. I'm scared. You know, we went through some sessions. We did that. And then she called me a week after our last session and said, hey, I just got a call yesterday. They said that was one of the best sales presentations they've seen. And I got the job. They offered me the job. I'm like, whoa, amazing, right? Because it's really just that focus on how can I communicate more effectively? How can, get, how can I get out of my own head and step into the space of what somebody else needs and wants? Because we all have needs and wants in our own head. And if somebody can connect with that, we're more likely to listen to them. 
Is there a, a part in your training where you cover when not to speak? Yes. Yes, we do talk about, especially in conversation, active listening. And I, and I share the story of when I was a kid growing up in New York City, I would look out my window and there, was, there would be these girls playing double dutch. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen double dutch being played, but double dutch, there's two ladies or two girls or two people um, at two sides of a rope and they're both swinging the ropes. And somebody's prepping to jump in and they're kind of, you know, doing this back and forth motion while they're waiting their timing. And I said that a lot of us do that with conversation. Somebody's talking and we're not really listening. What we're doing is we're seeking a break. We're, we're trying to find this break where we can put our thoughts in. And so the reason that we do that is that we're uncomfortable with silence. One of the reasons that we use filler words is that we're uncomfortable with silence. Our brain and our mouth are going at two different speeds. And so if one is going faster than the other, and we reach a moment where we feel like, oh my gosh, I don't have something to fill in here. We say, uh, or we say, um, because the silence, we don't want to, we don't want to leave the moment empty or empty. It seems to us, but it's not really empty because it, maybe your audience is taking a moment to process what you're saying as well. So that silence is absolutely okay. And as, as a matter of fact, the silence may even create a greater impact in what you're saying. So uh, listening is, is huge and silence is huge. Let me ask you a, a, a technique question because I'm just uh, curious. I was in a meeting last night and um, it's the third meeting I've been with the same group. And mm -hmm. uh, there's one woman who's, who's in it who will go on and on and on and on and on. And so, you know, in my mind, uh, and now let me uh, clarify this group. There's, there is no leader in the group. It's a group. Mm -hmm. And so um, what is the technique that you are, are supposed to use? You know, like I, what I try to do is listen, 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 be patient. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I could really kind of sense the rest of the group is getting bored with <laughs> <laughs> with the person who's speaking. Yeah. And I look for an opportunity when there is a lull to change the subject to something else. Mm -hmm. Is that what would be the proper technique? So is so let me before I share a technique, what is is there a facilitator at all? Does do you agree in the group that that there's not necessarily a group leader, but for this meeting, there is will a, have somebody facilitate the conversation. There is a facilitator. Okay. And, um, and she is very good. Mm -hmm. She, you can see her technique is similar to what I just explained as well, mm -hmm. which she'll look for a way to transition the person. So I, you know, I, I will, will typically only jump in if, if, uh, I can, if I can sense that the rest of the group well, it's getting to a point where they're getting annoyed and, and, and cause I've seen people drop out, yeah. you know? So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm questioning this because I think everybody, every one of our listeners are, have individual questions about things that they've noticed that they don't know what to do with. Right. And it comes to either active listening or it comes to speaking or whatever, you know? Yeah. Well, group dynamics are, are definitely different. And there's a technique that I use even as an interviewer that I translate over into group dynamics sometimes, especially if I'm a facilitator. So when I'm interviewing someone and if I am, if I find that the interviewee is going on longer than we have time for, or than makes sense for the audience, what I use is, is a disrupt mechanism sometimes. And so sometimes I'll interrupt without seeming rude. And it's simply the person is talking and I'll say, hold on, wait, wait, wait a minute. You just said something really interesting. Hmm. Can you take 30 seconds and go a little bit deeper on that. So I've done a couple of things. I've disrupted what just what what pattern they had going on. 
I've created a frame for them to speak about something specific. And subconsciously, I've also said, can you take 30 seconds? I've also shared some time blocking in there. So in group dynamics or in a group, sometimes that's a technique that, that I'll use. And sometimes as a group, we, we know that we're all there for an hour. We know that we're all there for 45 minutes. I might say, wow, that was a fantastic point. What, just for the sake of time, can you take just 30 more seconds and go over and just give us a, a wrap up on, on how you did that specific thing? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. now what you're also doing is you're also, you're interrupting, but you're also not, I don't want to use the, I don't want to say feeding the ego, but you're also congratulating and you're also putting good feelings into the person that you just interrupted because they know that you found some value in, in what they said. And you also gave them the cue that, Hey, I'm listening to you. I hear you. I haven't, I haven't tuned out that you just said something gold. You just said something interesting. And I want to know a little bit more about that. Uh, and maybe next time we'll have a, ch a chance to, to share a little bit more about it. Yeah. I could see where the training that you're doing, uh, you know, the, the solutions that you just gave, that you just gave, right. Mm -hmm. But those are powerful. Um, you know, cause you know, we all think when you say, Oh, well, I'm taking a class about communication. You know, you think it's all about me speaking, right. but it's not. It's about group dynamics. It's about listening. It's about uh, solutions to, to different types of personalities. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's really, it shouldn't even be called how to communicate better. It should really have a, a different name, shouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, communication is a big area. It's a big area. I mean, I, I don't have s workshops that are just called how to communicate. There, we have one called how to create messages that move, right? And so really that is for leaders who want to ensure that when people leave a meeting, they're moved to action. Because we find that a lot of times you have a meeting or you have a group session and you have so many bits of information and then you wonder why nothing gets done. Is there a way to create a big idea? Is there a way to create what we call a catalyst that allows people to say, ah, that's the one thing you want me to remember. Okay. Here's my action. You know, what's your, what's your call to action at the end of that? We've got another one called sport storyify your speech and improve your influence, how to use the storytelling framework to really reach people and connect with people even, even more effectively, man, you could, you could, you've got companies called crucial conversations. How, how to how to speak when the temperature or to how to communi communicate or how to converse when the temperature is turned way up. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a good idea for you for a course, but you probably yeah. are doing it already. But um, it's um, not not how, you know, how to interact in Zoom meetings or how to how to, you know, how to have great Zoom meetings. I can. Yeah. Do you have anything yeah. like that now or no? We do, we do something called how to create great virtual experience. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, and we started doing that early on in the pandemic, probably around May of last year. Is it so. well attended or no? You know, it's, it's, we, we've, it's been up and down. Um, part of that may be due to how we have promoted it or shared it, but I think a lot of people feel like they know what they're doing in zoom meetings and some people feel like man it's just a virtual meeting why do i need to put extra work into it right because they're they're like well my my per my in person meetings were going swimmingly they were smashing and no they were not the difference is that in the in person meetings people couldn't turn their camera off <laughs> right? you, yeah. you can't be in the boardroom and put a bag yeah. over your head and be like okay i'm not paying attention now uh, <laughs> yeah, let me tell you something. Anybody who says that their in-person or Zoom meetings uh, uh, were going splendidly uh, yeah. is is uh, what's um, what's the right word I'm thinking of here uh, in de in denial. <laughs> Try <laughs> surveying the people in the meeting anonymously, and you'll get a nice little slap in the face because yeah. uh, you know. Listen, the, the other part about this, even if you are, um, yeah. you know, knowing how to 
solicit ideas yeah. out of a Zoom meeting um, or out of any meeting, you know, uh, that's the real challenge because a lot of times you'll get your best idea from the person who speaks the least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, one of the other things is that I think I love your denial term. What people were in denial of as well is that we were going to be virtual or hybrid for a long time. Yeah. We kind of like, no, this, this pandemic is going to be done soon. And we're going to be back in person. We don't need to learn virtual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I listen, if you're running a company now, yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's a very interesting topic to me. I think, you know, how do you build a company culture mm -hmm. if you're not having this coffee clutch? I don't know if coffee clutch is a word, but you know, if you're having those you make it up. Yeah, <laughs> conversations. I just, you know, I think that, you know, and, and Zoom is so structured, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not running a big company anymore. So I don't have a, a lot of people working for me anymore. I mean, it's a very small staff. And so we, you know, it, it's not that type of company anymore where it's so entrepreneurial that you know, new ideas are such a big deal and such a, and, right. and it's a big group. But it's it's I you know I do know that that entrepreneurs underestimate the power of culture, mm -hmm. and in fact, it probably was one of the most important things about your company. And if you can't communicate and have your team embrace culture, which you know is is a challenge in a Zoom environment, I think that you're company's gonna struggle yeah yeah you know, so it, it's a challenge in a zoom environment it's a challenge in any environment it's true it really calls for being intentional about addressing it intentional about reminding people about it and keeping culture and vision and mission front and center right because it's it's some it's easy to forget you know, you, you've got this, you've got this message. We got the vision. We slap it up on a wall. People walk by the wall. It becomes a part of the background. Right. And then, and, and things go awry and it's a while before people, it clicks and they say, oh my gosh, the reason why this is going wrong is because we forgot to remind ourselves about the people we serve, the customers that we have committed to our core values and, and what we stand for. We, we just, we fell off the wagon a little bit. And, it's okay. That's human. That's human. You know, we, we, we have so many different bits of information, new pieces of software, new applications, new processes, new technologies. All of these things are coming at us all the time. And so something is bound to give. Something's bound to give. So we've got to remind ourselves sometimes, you know, who we are, what we stand for, and get back to what our trunk is, what our foundation is, and what our core is, and move from there. So I'm going to tell you a story and I, uh, I had no, th this is the first time uh, that I've ever told this on air. It's 9.53 um, Excuse me. Uh, and, um, my wife recently passed away unexpectedly and, wow. um, and That's my, right. thank you. And my 21 year old son, uh, who's up in, uh, Boston, I'm, I'm in New Jersey. Um, he's at college. He, he made the suggestion. He goes, because the way I communicated with my son was a lot different than my way my wife did, um, mm -hmm. where she would talk to him every day. They would text all the time. And about once a week, I would get on the phone with, with Mike and, and just get caught up. And then I, in between that, I would hear from my, uh, my wife what was going on. you know. And so uh, when my wife passed away, my son said, hey, Dad, why don't we have a Zoom meeting? over lunch every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right. And so we, we, we get our lunch and we sit there and we eat our lunch together and we just kind of catch up. Yeah. Right. It's been fantastic. It's been fantastic. And the reason being is things come up in that conversation. That's not scheduled. <laughs> yeah. You know, versus a meeting where you say, okay, well, we're going to have a meeting on Monday at nine o'clock to go over the results of the prior quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no um, going beyond that in many regards. And then there's also a time element, which, you mm -hmm. know, which is fine. But 
Um, so, you know, I, I think that people uh, need to uh, include um, that type of uh, unstructured mm -hmm. communication in their, uh, their, their new Zoom virtual, because I agree with you, this isn't going away. People like it too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done sessions last year, this year, where we've had hundreds of people in the room. And instead of just saying, hey, I'm going to give you a speech, we set, set aside some moments to send people into breakout rooms just to get to know each other. Mm. Right? We had That's this one, act, one activity we did where I started by, I, you know, took two minutes. You know, we played music, we danced for a few moments. And then I said, hey, I'm going to send you guys into groups of about five in, in breakout rooms. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to find uh, an item in your house that is meaningful to you and come back and take about 30 seconds to share with your group why that's meaningful to you. And I said, the, the only rule that I'm going to set here is that it cannot be something within arm's reach. You actually have to get up out of your seat to go get something. Oh, wow. Right? So yeah. it, it was fun because now you're on the Zoom meeting and there's this kinesthetic piece to it. Now you've got to move, right? Yeah, you got to get up out your seat. And then now you're intentionally searching around your house for something that, okay, I'm thinking about that. It's, and as you're going through your house, you're, you're thinking about things and, and you're, you're literally accessing memories. You're accessing experiences. And so as you, you, you prioritize these experiences, now you come back and you say, hey, I found this, this apple. Or, hey, I found this sweater. And this is meaningful to me because blah, blah, blah. And, and there were some great stories that came out of that. And when, when people come back every time, they're like, dude, that wasn't enough time. We were so enjoying getting to know each other because we don't do that on a regular basis at work. You know, I didn't know that Stephen had uh, uh, um, somebody in his family that, that passed away recently. I didn't know that that Stephen had a son at college. I didn't know that this person liked um, Count Chocula <laughs> yeah. or, or whatever, you know? So it's, yeah, I mean, it's it, really important. You really that. bring up a good point, And that is the thing that makes a company interesting or makes people enjoy working there mm -hmm. are all those stories that, that are not related to work. What yeah. makes a job boring is when you're just doing your job and there's no understanding of the people who are around you. Yeah. Right. And, um, that's how people move around their jobs a lot. You're talking about having turnover it's because mm -hmm. people have, will have no emotional, um, attachment to the company anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, I, I um, I really like what you're saying. You know, it, uh, Robert, when we when we uh, picked the topic to talk about today, I didn't expect it to go in the direction that we went today. Yeah, you know, it was uh, a very and and you know, you're a great storyteller. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and and so and I and that what made me stuck what stick in, stuck in my mind is the thing you said about Warren Buffett. Yeah. You know, was the that he said it was the best course that he had ever taken. My my best course that I ever took was uh, not a course, but I actually took Dale Carnegie's management uh, course, which mm -hmm. I thought was very very good because I really needed help. I was not a good manager when I first started. Um, but the book that I read, which was uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Fr in uh, Friends and Influence People, by far yeah. was the best business book I've ever read, and. You know, even the way he titled that, you know, if he had titled it, um, how to influence people. Yeah. You know, the fact that he communicated it differently, how to win friends and influence people, I think changes the whole structure of the book. Yeah. You know, and so I think the fact that you're telling us about the other courses that you offer um, are powerful uh, ways for us to improve as, as business leaders and, and as leaders of other organizations as well. So I thank you for sharing that. 
Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This has been fantastic. So I'd like to thank so very much uh, Robert Kennedy from Kennick uh, Communications for coming on today's podcast. If you like today's uh, podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your business, you can call us at 862-207-4118 or visit our website at fscreditline.com. Again, that's FS, FS as in Financing Solutions, creditline.com. Uh, Robert, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? I make it easy to find me. I'm Robert Kennedy three on all social media and my main website, my speaker website is Robert Kennedy com, And you can also find our company at kinetic communications.com. And kinetic uh, communications is for everybody is K E N N E T I K K O M M U N I C A T I O N S. So that's a K. That's correct. Yes. And uh, so, so Robert, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate you, Stephen. And for and for our listeners, and if you're interested in getting any new business ideas, I tweet daily at S Halasnik, which is my name, S Halasnik, S H A L A S N I K. And um, also, I just want to thank everyone out there for listening. Uh, You guys are all out there working hard, but please take some time out of your day and make sure that you're getting better at what you do. Everybody, see you later.